So, uh, thank you, Professor Gallagher. My name is Amar, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Conservative System. Um, I've got two questions. First of all, um, perhaps you could develop the point of entrenchment that you just made a little bit further. Um, essentially, could the Supreme Court strike down legislation which breaches the, um, the new constitutional statute? And if not, how is it anything more than sort of a sort of good faith agreement? This is particular, particularly about your point about, um, about power sharing earlier on. And then also proportional representation. So I think you mentioned that it might be a possibility for the new, um, the new upper house. Yeah. But if it could be beneficial there, why is it not in Labour's proposal to the House of Commons when, in theory at least, it could deal with some of the issues of elective di dictatorship, um, small small party rebellions could bring down um, government majorities, other than the obvious fact that it would probably reduce Labour's and the Conservatives' vote share significantly? Well, it certainly reduce both parties' vote share, I suspect. Um, to deal with your first question first, um, What's envisaged here is that there will be statutory provision which says uh, when the new power can be used uh, by the second chamber, uh, and, that it, but, and that is that the court, the job of the court is merely to say this power is engaged or not engaged. If the power is engaged, it, it will be illegal to pass, uh, and, the, and the second chamber says no, uh, it will not be possible to pass the legislation for uh, royal assent. Uh, and that will be set out in law, so it, it won't happen. And uh, so the, the court won't be involved in that at, at, at that stage. The court's job is merely to decide whether the power is engaged or not. And um, uh, just look at the detail of that. Um, there's actually a very well developed jurisprudence now uh, on the extent to which um, an issue relates to something. Uh, for those of you who are into this stuff, it's the pith and substance doctrine uh, under another label. It's been used in the devolution uh, statutes and been used very successfully. So we're, we're pretty confident that the uh, Supreme Court will be able to say this bill relates to the Human Rights Act or this bill relates to uh, the Scotland Act or the Civil Convention or whatever it might be. We're reasonably confident about that. Why not PR? Well, uh, first, um, as, uh, we could have read PR, I suppose, but the proposition here is to find a set of changes that can address the problems in uh, uh, this one session, one parliament. Uh, so this, these are changes which could be made after a general election before the next one uh, and would be effective over that period. Uh, in a sense, you're right, of course, that um, what we're talking about is undivided power. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, Hailsham's point uh, was that um, in an elective dictatorship comes when you have one, a majoritarian system, and two, a weak second chamber. You've gone for one or the other, we've gone for the other. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, look, back here. Do you see there being any scope to have an English assembly within the United Kingdom? Because I, I, I understand during the Brexit referendum, a, a lot of people, English people, said that they felt a bit left out by the devolution settlement. And I know that David Cameron tried unsuccessfully um, English sports for English, English laws. Do, do you see um, some sort of English assembly as being a way to, um, you know, perhaps quell people's frustrations about the system as, as, as a way of sort of bringing power closer to them? No. And I'll tell you why. Um, first, Westminster is England's Parliament, and everybody in England thinks that. Uh, and I don't think we should take the Parliament away from us. That would be a very bad thing to do. Uh, and second, um, what we uh, let, me sh let, let me show another slide as a special treat. Um, I've been looking forward to being able to do this, so that I thought ahead. Um, Identity is a really interesting thing. I didn't quite see all of that, uh, but. Most people have multiple levels of identity. Uh, sometimes uh, they think that they are. Um, sometimes they think they're British. Sometimes they think they're English or Scottish or Welsh. Sometimes they think they're Londoners or from Yorkshire or from Glasgow or whatever it might be. Uh, and identity politics, as I said uh, in my remarks, um, uh, often takes wing from other underlying concerns. And I'm absolutely sure that, that Brexit took wing from the fact that people feel ignored and economically left behind. They wanted to get some agency in their lives. Um, so uh, 
my view on this, the campaign for an English parliament is another example of that. What people really want uh, in England, and we know this because when they get it, they like it, uh, is regional representation. And it's the bigger challenge, to be honest, uh, is um, making the meso level of government in England work at the right geographical level, to be both politically representative and engaging, and to be economically relevant. So all the evidence says that to get economic relevance, to promote economic growth, you need uh, governance arrangements that cover a good number of millions of people, five million, two million, that kind of number. That's the international evidence. Our political identities don't quite match that. They tend to be at smaller levels typically. So finding a way of getting the right level of regional, city regional government in England is the, is the main answer, I think, to doing with the English question. That said, in this report, we do say that there is scope uh, to do two things in respect of all England issues. Uh, one is actually to find something that worked better than English votes for English laws. Um, uh, hand up, I take the blame. I argue for English votes for English laws. That went well. Uh, uh, we uh, provided for it and never used it. Um, but there is, uh, I think, scope. I still think scope in Westminster for English voices to be separately heard. And second, and, and, and more constructively, we need to think about the way we construct uh, the inside the government, because we have some departments that are purely English. Uh, we should have more of those, actually, and we should, and it's suggested in this commission report, we should probably have an English uh, uh, sort of cabinet half, English cabinet committee, probably chaired by the Prime Minister, to deal with English issues only. Right. Given the criticism that the Supreme Court has had in recent years, particularly in the Miller decisions, do you think that the Supreme Court, in the way it's set up just now, would be able to withstand the criticism that you get if it was determining what subjects and legislation the sitting chamber could basically prevent? I think they're tougher than they look. Um, they, uh, the Supreme Court, um, I feel sometimes quite sorry for them, uh, because they are thrown into the, the, uh, the, the political um, uh, maelstrom, uh, they never quite know when a case which they thought was quite technical turned out to be extremely uh, controversial. But they're volunteers, um, so I, I, I think they, they would manage this. They managed. The, I mean, one of the one of the things that's worked really well in the devolution world uh, is the uh, jurisprudence that the Supreme Court has developed, and I think they would be entirely capable uh, of having jurisprudence in this area as well. I'm not worried about them. Thank you. I don't know. Who goes first? Um, yeah, so on the point about English laws and the yeah. same sort of English decision making, if the regional devolution within England would be comparable to the level within Scotland and Wales, mm -hmm. why would that actually be necessary to have that sort of level of decision making? And if it would still be necessary, why would the level of devolution given to English region not be comparable? To that kind of I, think, to, I think it's important to distinguish here between executive and legislative devolution. Uh, and the proposition in, in this report, uh, which I uh, am strongly in favour of, uh, is that the boundaries on the executive devolution in England, in principle, uh, should be as wide as the boundaries on executive devolution in Wales or Scotland. Why not? You know, why, why couldn't the mayor of Manchester and the surrounding area? Responsible for policing or managing the NHS. No reason at all. Um, the, uh, but legislative devolution is different. So, the way we addressed that question was to say actually, since Westminster is the legislature of England, it should be able to legislate for subsets of England. This goes back to this idea of special local legislation. But I don't think there is an appetite or, uh, for. Um, you know, separate legal jurisdictions in Yorkshire. Um, I don't that would work. I don't make sense, actually. Jeff, what was you? Uh, yeah, in the beginning of your talk, you discussed you know, how distrusted Parliament is and yeah. parliamentarians are. So how can we get buy-in into such broad sweeping reforms if they're being introduced by these same massively <coughs> distrusted parliamentarians? That's, that's, a, that's a, good, a good question. Um, first, um, this would have to be, if it's done, uh, done by a, a new government, the present government, I'm going to do it. Uh, and it would be part of a reform program of a new government. Uh, so there's a challenge for a new administration there. Uh, second, um, if this is about 
the distribution of power to people outside Westminster, uh, then we have um, the opportunity to give power to people whom we can reasonably expect to be trusted, actually, because they, the data tells us the folk nearer the voters are more trusted than the voters. So getting some uh, uh, some new voices and different powers, I think, will of itself increase the trust. Uh, and let me um, just have a bit of fun with my slides again. And talk about cleaning up politics, because we've got to do that too. And there's a bit of fun in here. I say a bit of fun, but it's a, I think it's an interesting recommendation. Um, uh, an annual citizen's jury, uh, whose job it is to look at how the ethics system has worked, to review all the cases that happened over the last year in Westminster and in Whitehall, and come to a view on whether that has increased public trust or not. My goodness, uh, let's see what that, who passes that exam. Uh, so I think trust is really, really important. It's a structural problem. It's really about the location of power, uh, but it is also a behavioural problem, and we need to address the behavioural problem. <laughs> um, uh, my good friend Ian McLean uh, in Oxford is uh, online, hope you're still with us, Ian, asks, what's the risk that Labour wins a working majority in the next general election? Doesn't do very well in Scotland. And the Labour unicameralists, uh, uh, that's Fred and George, uh, kick out your upper race recommendation. Well, there's no certainty in anything, I'm afraid, uh, 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 Ian. I think unicameralism is probably even further uh, than I would want to go, and probably than, than you would want to go. Um, my, my best guess, it, it, and I listen to what politicians say, and they say to me, they want to do this, and I'm an innocent so belief that what we shall see. Um, I, don't, I, I think, to be honest, uh, to answer your question more directly, uh, it seems to me that the risk is not that there's another plan comes along and makes the borders are simply abolished, is that nothing happens. It, it, it's, it's, this, uh, it's this set of recommendations or something very like them or nothing at all. So that's the risk that has to be managed. Uh, and Desmond Nolte asks, um, uh, in between both Canada and Australia, there are mechanisms between the federal and the state level uh, which reflect need, uh, and this is resource distribution. Ah, yes, now this is uh, what we call in the game the Barnum formula question. Um, hands up those of you who can explain the Barnum formula. Uh, for the benefit of those online, there's not a hand in the room <laughs> in the air. That's a pity. Um, I, 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 uh, I often think that the Barnum formula uh, is uh, a very strange uh, historical accident uh, which happens to work and happens to benefit Scotland, let's be clear. Uh, it's, not, it's not a needs based mechanism. Um, what we say uh, in the report here is that. Uh, one of the key functions of central government in all of this uh, is to ensure uh, that there is a reasonably equitable distribution of resource, which obviously does have to bear in mind need. Uh, and there's a you know, suggested principle, which is that no part of the country should be unable to deliver an acceptable level of public service uh, because of lack of resources or relative lack of resources. Um, and in particular, the uh, idea of having guaranteed social rights, uh, which are to some degree justiciable, it's an interesting question of just how justiciable individual level they should be. Uh, but and I think the point of saying what has to happen at the centre uh, is to say that once you have decentralisation, and once you know that, then you're going to decentralisation. Uh, and in order to deliver, again, the social rights are written here, a degree of equity in the redistribution and the distribution of resources is essential. Uh, what we didn't do, uh, and weren't asked to do, uh, is doing needs assessment across the UK, uh, which has been tried twice in history, both difficult uh, and difficult on both occasions. That's one here in the middle. Lots of your recommendations seem designed for specific cooperation. What if they specific gridlock instead? Are there any other second chamber which would, if, why should a Labour government and that policy which is potentially hamstring it, if there's a Conservative or right majority in the second chamber, shouldn't they focus on enacting more <coughs> policy which benefits, like the social movement they comes out of, rather than enacting constitutional change which could potentially hamstring their own goals? 
Well, uh, that's the um, the argument that, that some folk have made, particularly uh, um, some members of the House of Lords have got to say, uh, you know, don't waste your time um, uh, get rid of us, get on with the real job. But in the long run, um, if we are going to address the, the, the underlying questions, which it seems to me that a centre government ought to answer, which is essentially about the geographical inequality of the UK, I think you have to address these power questions. In the short run, what you've certainly got to do uh, is a pretty radical uh, devolution of practical power uh, across the territory. There's a, there's a big assumption in here about how economic growth works. Uh, that, uh, as I said in my remarks, the traditional approach in the UK to economic growth uh, is that um, if you get the macroeconomy right, uh, just let the system work, uh, and where success builds, it will gradually spill out. Well, it has to gradually spill out. Uh, the assumption that underlies uh, uh, the economic assumption that underlies this report uh, is that um, you need different economic approaches in different places because the economic growth that will happen in different places will be different. Uh, and this is this idea of clusters. Uh, which is um, which is quite fashionable in the centre of the city, which is very strong. Uh, so the uh, there's always going to be tension between doing the, the long run and the short run in any government, and most gov most governments have to try and do both. Uh, uh, if, it, if there were a new Liberal government, it's going to face some very serious short term problems. No doubt about that. Um, but then any government will, uh, and the, the the challenge will be to do. That set of issues at the same time as you're doing this one. It's not very really easy. Uh, but again, these guys are volunteers as well. That's what we're That was a really interesting talk. Thanks very much. Um, I've got a question on the second jobs thing. So, mm -hmm. a substantial number of MPs have set second jobs, around sort of 170 to sort of 200 ish. Yeah. Um, do you think that if you're going to ban second jobs, that the pay of MPs needs to be really reviewed? In a sort of, to be increased. Personally, um, I, I think um, um, MPs are unpaid. Um, I think that's a fact of life. Um, uh, and uh, if it were down to me, I would feel a little bit more, a bit working a bit harder, I'd feel a little bit more. They would be performance related pay um, uh, But uh, I think we, we, most countries would regard the level of second jobbing, which we see in our problem, as unacceptable. Um, and there are people earning, at least one person earning about a million pounds a year, in addition to an MP salary. Um, now, I'm not serious, an MP salary should be a million pounds a year, let's be clear. Uh, but personally, I, I, I would pay MPs a bit more in, in because that, those problems that we got, do you, do you remember all those expenses, problems that we had? Uh, and there was an implicit message that was given to MPs. No one ever said it, and no one ever meant it, but it was. Oh, we don't pay you very much, but don't worry, you can get a bit, it's kind of bit your expenses. Well, that's completely improper. Uh, we don't have to pay them properly. Uh, and uh, at the moment, the, um, the, I can't remember what the AP salary number is. Uh, most people regard it as a very good salary, but um, in comparison to other jobs, uh, some of the responsibility that they're doing is all that high. Uh, but second jobbing uh, has got out, got out of hand, actually. Uh, it's one thing to say, uh, I'm a GP and I'd like to do some sessions. Uh, to keep my, my qualifications up. It's quite a lot to say, well, actually, you know, I, my, my main job is journalism, if you don't mind. Not getting anyone in particular. I'm going to do that. Um, a couple more uh, of the online questions. Um, so, uh, uh, Robert Greenley asked, well, why, why are you getting rid of the delay power for the, in, for the new second chamber? Um, why not? Um, allow the second chamber to um, continue to have the capacity to delay legislation, to use it as leverage uh, uh, to ensure that amendments are made. Well, that's, that, that, that's a balance. Um, I, I can see uh, an argument um, uh, for doing that, actually, and that's not an implausible argument. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about the delay power is um, how infrequently it is used, and how seldom it is threatened. Does anybody know? What it was last used for? Anybody know what the last act of um, um, back to Parliament isn't an act, it was the late. Welsh disestablishment? Fox hunting. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> you know, uh, if we're reduced to arguing about fox hunting, we're in the wrong place. Uh, so, um, 
Uh, it's not, in my view, been an effective thing, but I can see an argument for giving a bit more uh, leverage. Um, it's easy, um, it, at this point, somebody usually says, but the House of Lords does lots of good work, uh, and lots and lots of amendments are passed in the House of Lords which improve bills. That's just true. It's absolutely true. And sometimes there are amendments which are uh, promoted by particularly uh, the love only uh, crossbench peers, uh, which are, have that effect. But most of the amendments made in the House of Lords of the government correcting its own mistakes. It would be better if bills were introduced without mistakes put in them. Yeah, I, think, I think that's maybe all the... On, on, please, Paolo Sandri, hi, Paolo. Um, is, there, is there a contradiction in the objective of... I can't read this, unfortunately. Security. Securing devolution through the veto power of the second chamber, providing an override mechanism for government. No, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why, if I look. Um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a degree of um, uh, real politic in this, in that the House of Commons is the main elected chamber, and it is not our, it's not our intention in this material uh, to use up that function. It's to find something to complement it. Uh, and the real politic is, well, we have to get both these houses to agree to this, including the Commons. And one reason we haven't reformed the House of Lords at the Commons is that the House of Commons is scared of what it might do. Right? Uh, so what we've got here is a, is a careful balance to ensure that the House of Commons remains the supremacy, that remains the main place where the big issues of the day are decided, where the budget's decided, where the government's formed, uh, and, and where the legislative initiative lies. And the House of Lords will really, Second Chamber will complement it uh, and will have particular power uh, in, in relation uh, to the Constitution. And, uh, um, obviously, the, the override mechanism, uh, the DC of the override mechanism, then does matter a lot. If the override mechanism is just, I say so and you can't, that's what we have to do. So that doesn't work. So there are two suggestions <coughs> in the uh, report. One is a two thirds majority. Try getting a two thirds majority in the House of Commons, well, it's very difficult. Uh, 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 and, uh, and another is uh, going back actually to 1911 repeated general elections. Um, I personally would, uh, of the two of those, I, I would favour um, uh, the former. But I do think uh, that um, this goes back to the laws of the Medes and the Persians. Um, it has to be possible to change constitutional laws. Uh, uh, this is a way of getting a kind of constitutional amendment provision for the UK that allows more than one set of voices over it. Dicey famously uh, said that the UK Parliament is both an ordinary legislature and a constitutive one, one that makes the laws and decides how the laws are made. But what we're saying here is that uh, if it's going to decide how the laws are made, it's a process of greater difficulty and greater solemnity. Okay. Now, any last question here? Uh, right, two very quick ones, front and back. So, gentlemen, so, you stole my bold beard. <laughs> so, if you could elaborate uh, uh, on your link between the economic development and the constitution. Yeah. Because for me, I mostly agree uh, with uh, your suggestions, but I failed to see a bit the link. And I could give you a counter example of uh, the economic history of the US in which basically early on when states had a lot of power, it was a poor economy. And then as the federal government gave, gained power uh, with the civil war, it actually it's when the US developed a lot and did a lot of right things, uh, but it also has a lot of transfers within the country, but again, good decision-making. Um, so I don't see so much the link because it seems to me that if you have good politicians, central government can work well. It's when you have bad ones that doesn't work. So in that sense, I see more these suggestions as limiting the harm that bad politicians can do in the central government. But I don't see so much uh, how it would uh, okay. uh, improve the economic development statistics that you mentioned in the beginning. Good question. OK, and Jim, what about us two, two together? So, uh, thank you very much for the talk, Professor Gallagher, and I apologize for another US to UK comparison. I'm sure it's time <laughs> for you. I just wonder, you know, it's a recent, relatively recent American development, it's the tendency for states to drag the executive 
central government, you know, through the courts, through judicial review to try and kind of thwart their agenda. You know, we saw it in the last administration and in the current one. I was just wondering if you see this, you know, for better or for worse, as a potential ramification of these changes that local government would get the power to kind of hamstring the uh, the latitude of the central government. Okay. So uh, first of all, this link uh, between um, decentralized political power and local economic development. Um, the, the, the theoretical argument here uh, is that one size fits all economic approaches do not work. And they certainly have worked for us uh, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and you do need to tailor your local economic development style to what your local economy is and where your local opportunities are. Um, and that's the that's the theoretical argument. Uh, and uh, the empirical base for that is that one looks at um, and there's a huge literature on this, enormous literature on regional economic development, uh, that most places get the best success in regional economic development when it's locally led. Um, and locally, by local, I mean, this goes back to the point I was making earlier about the scale at which uh, these things are best done. Um, typically, economic development operates well at the scale of three to five million populations, because that's where economies work. Uh, and there's certainly lots of European evidence, um, uh, and I'm not so sure about that, about what, whether the US story is uh, good or bad. And history is a um, history is a um, uh, can mislead us sometimes. With lots of other lot stuff is going on at the same time. Um, but if you look at what the OECD suggests, if you look at what the uh, economic development academics suggest, uh, you're going to go for a chunk of decentralized power, a chunk of central resource which is redistributable, because otherwise you, you don't have it, uh, and mechanisms uh, to ensure that investment is geographically uh, well focused. Uh, so one of the uh, mechanisms proposed in which I didn't mention uh, was the uh, uh, essentially uh, bribing the venture capital industry to look beyond London. Which, uh, which badly needs to do it, uh, and, uh, and others is um, using private money to invest in the uh, infrastructure world, which also needs to do it. I think we shouldn't be naive about this. Uh, political decentralisation doesn't always does not guarantee economic development. Um, uh, Wales is an excellent country example of decentralisation for decades. On the other hand, Scotland is a relatively good example of start foot. Done so well over the last decade or so, but historically, uh, over periods of 40, 40 50 years, uh, Scotland was largely uh, decentralised uh, administratively, and actually, its economic growth was, was pretty steady for a long time. So, uh, I'm not naive of thinking it, but um, uh, certainly our present model doesn't work, that, that, that's for sure. Um, uh, is this a large charter? Uh, I wonder if the lawyers have got a charter already in this country, I'm afraid. Um, we've seen a lot, um, we're about to see yet another uh, case between the Scottish Government and the UK Government over uh, GR's, uh, uh, gender recognition. Uh, and that's going to be going to go up all the court levels. It's going to start the court session in Edinburgh. It's going to be appealed there and it's going to be appealed to the Supreme Court. Uh, chances are the Scottish Government will lose, but they might not. I'm not going to absolutely tell. Uh, and we've had a lot of that lately. Um, sometimes, I'm afraid, you, you do have to let my line of friends out um, because of what we've seen, uh, uh, and I'm sorry to say this is a bit of a partisan point, but uh, the Johnson administration was out of order and it was only the courts which called, which called it back in several times. So um, the good chap method, the good chap theory of government, which is that a decent fellow does the right thing to do and won't do the wrong thing, has sadly been disproven. Uh, and uh, our only recourse, I'm afraid, is to make some laws. <coughs> it's a bit of me. <coughs> Excuse me. As it is me rather regrets that, uh, because it does constrain. Uh, but in the end, um, uh, it, it, uh, the behaviour we've seen and the changes we've seen uh, mean that we have no alternative uh, but to rely on a bit more legislation. Uh, there's a lot in this material, however, uh, which is about trying to make executives work together. 
<coughs> and in the long run, uh, that's the way uh, to make sure that you don't end up in court. Uh, and in the, in the GRC case, it's nice to think they might have avoided that, but they didn't. Time has gone on hugely. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.